flowers. All of their different colors, shapes, patterns and smells have been attracting humans forever. But they're not just pretty decorations. Flowers are essential for keeping the plant species going, since they're critical for the plant's reproduction. Not all plants bear flowers, however. For example, you might remember from our pine reproduction video that the gymnosperm reproductive structure is a cone. I'll put a link to the video in the description below, in case you want to learn about gymnosperm reproduction. But back to our flowering plants, the angiosperms. The shape, color and intriguing structures you see in flowers are not just coincidence. Every single part that composes a flower has a very concrete function. So let's dive into learning about them. Before we start, you should keep in mind that all of the flower structures we're going to talk about are highly variable across plant species, so they aren't always as clearly definable as the textbook examples show us. Even just fusion of some flower structures, which is a very frequent occurrence, gives the flower a very different overall look, and it might be confusing to quickly understand what you're looking at. However, knowing what parts to look for and where to look for them will help you tremendously in understanding the morphology of whatever flower you might be looking at. In an evolutionary sense, all of these flower parts are considered to be modified leaves, and you can think of them as layers or whorls. I suggest we start from the bottom layer of a flower and work our way up. The first layer, or the outermost whorl, is referred to as the calyx. The calyx consists of individual units called sepals. They can be free or sometimes fused together. Sepals serve as protection for a developing flower from potentially harsh environmental influences, as well as helping to deter insects from feeding on the bud and keeping the humidity inside the bud high. You can clearly see sepals when the flower is still in bud. At that time, the sepals enclose the whole bud, and as the reproductive structures inside mature and the flower starts to open up, the sepals open up as well, creating a sort of ball or cup underneath the blossom. They are often green leaf-like structures, but might take on many different forms. Look at this plumbago flower, which has a calyx with glandular hairs. Those hairs are sticky and can trap insects. In some plants, you can see one more whorl underneath the calyx. This is called an epicalyx, and it consists of bracts. An epicalyx can be found especially in the family Malvaceae, containing plants such as hibiscus or malvaviscus that I'm showing you here. Moving on above the calyx, we come to the corolla, which is in the most cases the most colorful and conspicuous part of a flower. It consists of petals and its main function is to attract pollinators. Pollinators that come to visit flowers disperse the pollen that gets caught on their bodies from one flower to another and while doing so, they are aiding in plants' reproduction. To attract pollinators, petals have evolved curious patterns, colors and shapes. These features are often different in different species and these variations may attract specific pollinators. Some flowers have evolved extra parts to lure pollinators. For example, the corona, which can be fringy like in a passion flower, or a tube-like structure as in a daffodil. Or they might have pronounced nectaries, such as in this flannel bush flower. On the other hand, in wind-pollinated flowers, such as those of grasses, the petals are completely missing and the flower structure is modified for effective wind pollination. But in plants with a corolla, the petals don't always look like colorful flat leaves forming a ring. Look at these arbutus flowers. The petals have fused into an urn-shaped corolla, so we can no longer distinguish individual petals. A similar thing is happening here with the goldfish flower, that's hiding the reproductive structures inside, only the stigma is sometimes peeking out. Sometimes there is no obvious distinction between sepals and petals, as they look very much alike, such as in this lily flower. In that case, we can call them tepals. However, when you look closely at this lily, you can see the first whorl, these are the sepals, and then the second whorl, these are the petals. So we can say the lily flower has three sepals and three petals, or six tepals. With the calyx and corolla, collectively called the perianth, 
we got through the non-reproductive or sterile flower parts. Now moving upwards to the next layer, or whorl, we get to the male reproductive structures, collectively called the andratium, which consist of individual stamens. Each stamen has a thread-like filament that supports an anther at the top. Inside the anthers, pollen grains are created. When they mature, the anthers split open, releasing the pollen grains, which you can see in these lily anthers. Here, the anther is still closed, while these are already opening, revealing the orange pollen grains. The final layer is the female reproductive organs, or carpels, collectively called the genetium. Each flower might have one or more carpels, usually located in the center of the flower. It consists of an ovary, a style, which is not always present, and a stigma at the top. The stigma is usually the most noticeable part of a carpel. It's the place where pollen grains land, so it's often aided by hairs or sticky surfaces to help the pollen grains stick. And that's the basic morphology of a simple, complete flower. However, there are many exceptions to these structures. Just think of plants from the composite family. Their inflorescences take on a different structure and ultimately different terminology. But this is for a future video. And what if you can find only male or only female structures in a flower? Well, that's a topic for the next week. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting me by subscribing to this channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next week.